In 2004, I, by chance, caught the Chicago premiere of a mean little slasher called Toolbox Murders. A remake and you know, essentially name and concept only. Toolbox Murders is not only an underrated early aughts horror flick, but one that is quite unseen as the general horror-loving community honestly has slept on this one. If you have any interest... No, you are, because it's f or warp. Here's my pitch. Directed by the legendary Toby Hooper and starring the always talented Angel Bettis, Toolbox Murders is a cynical post 9 11 slasher. Mixed with jet black humor, poking fun at LA culture, this has a cool setup alongside clever, gory, and mean spirited kills. So, you know, expect spoilers going forward. I am fully recommending Toolbox Murders. And for those on board for a revisit, let's go. Nice hearing from you, Carlos. I've come to realize that the defining line between eras doesn't quite solidify until you are far removed from it. Maybe because the 80s and 90s were already coded by the time I could, you know, conceptualize the differences, or that social media has blended the lines between history and current reality. But the early 2000s were an awkward period of transition. Yet, as it always does, the trope style and ambitions from the decade has come into its own. Toolbox Murders defines that part of the era better than some of its more popular contemporaries. Nell, played by Angela Bettis, and her husband Stephen, played by Brent Rome, have just moved into their new apartment during the big renovation. Lesman, as in this building, Lesman? The historic old hotel. That's now a shithole apartment complex run by the charming slum lord Byron the great Greg Travis. A killer lurks throughout the old hotel, killing residents via the tools in his toolbox. But when Nell's newly made friend All Out disappears, it'll lead her deep into the Loosemen's long and suspicious history and the killer that inhabits it. Toby Hooper, a master of horror and a man important for one of the greatest entries of the genre, has always had an eclectic filmography. You know, when compared to Wes or Carpenter, Hooper may not have had the same amount of hits, but I've really come to appreciate the variety in his filmography. There are some unloved gems in there, his serial killer slash killer croc flick, Eaten Alive. Of course, giving us one of the creepier vampire iterations with Sam's Lot, a 50s inspired alien invasion with invaders from Mars. Hell, I've been saying for years, The Mangler is really a misunderstood B-monster movie with Robert England going for broke. Power is what holds things together. But towards the end of his career, he returned to his slasher roots with Toolbox Murders. Opening with a cameo by Sherry Moon as Daisy Rain, we get a stormy LA night, a moody and atmospheric location, and a brutal kill with a hammer. Toolbox Murders works because it puts us in the shoes of decent people. Nell and Steven trying to move on from a tragedy and make a better life. And of course, they just get by the universe. The hotel turned apartment is literally falling apart on its best day, and it looks like the keyhole from Ford Heights at its worst. The inhabitants are kooky, strange, or dangerous, while the staff is little to no help. Of course, outside of my man Marco Rodriguez, who always gets the Rick Dalton point every time I see him. I'm like, yeah, dude makes everything better. Toby Hooper does a good job and sets up the main residents and their lives lived here. And of course, they start dropping out of existence one by one. Nell is the first to really notice something isn't uh, quite right. She's a bit nosy, cleverly aware, and doesn't take the strange noises at face value. As I mentioned earlier, there is a bit of black comedy. It almost borders on satire, with it being pointed at the residents and this seedy yet charming take on L.A. We're really a quiet building. Did I give you the storage keys? Dude, this guy is great. It's so odd and slimy, yet likable. Steven's asking about leaking water and, of course, a stove. Nell brings up the shower and Byron keeps backing out, trying to just keep talking long enough to get out the door and damn near run away. I mean, his entire goal right here is just leave before I have to fix anything. Julia, played by Juliette Landau, represents the lonely, health-obsessed Angelino who, new to the internet thing, leaves her webcam on constantly. Then there's Saffron, the new-agey chick that's into rough sex and, uh, punk. Chaz Rooker, the kind and chill old East Coast man 
Who knows, the key to life is less stress. Now yes, these may not be uh, deeply in-depth character studies, but I enjoyed the side characters more than I'd normally do. You know, it's such a dour and cynical tone. I really enjoyed how fun everyone ended up being here. As I've mentioned, Angela Bettis is just so natural at being kind and strong. Every time she shows up in a movie, it's instantly better. You see, that year I caught the Chicago premiere of this, and honestly, I knew very little of the movie itself. All I remember is that it was introduced by Bettis, who uh, had a few, though in all, in all honesty, we all did at that point in the night. I know she was cute and charming and doing a bunch of crowd work. The screening had the right amount of laughs, cheers, and applause. It was a hell of experience and something that I think back fondly on. What I appreciate about the writers Adam Garash and Jace Anderson is that Nell is instantly suspicious and basically plays detective while everyone around her dies. Making Nell the outsider that isn't being stalked or even related to the hotel story. You know, I think that kind of keeps the mysterious atmosphere and the threat of the unknown. But let's be honest, the slasher really lives or dies on its kills. And man, this is where Toolbox Murders shines. Now, I'm gonna be honest, YouTube won't let me show much, but you know, I'll do what I can. We get Daisy with a hammer to the head. Saffron gets nailed to death. Julia takes a drill through the back of the head. Louise, we get his hands nailed down and his face melted with lye. Byron gets his spine snapped. And real quick, I love his desire to end it all. And of course, Ned loses the top of his head. You know, there's just something about uh, the grimy aesthetic that I love here. And looking back, this was clearly the style of the time. Cinematographer Steven Yeldon does a lot to add to the overall uncomfortable atmosphere. And honestly, Coffin Baby is a great slasher villain and one I wish got a proper sequel in, instead of this murky rights cash grab bullshit. And something that's not advertised in the trailer or original box art or any of the marketing was the cool supernatural twist. I hate this cover here because I think it ruins it. The entire time you're supposed to believe it's probably Ned if not somebody else in the building. I always prefer a bit of mysticism in my horror and, and making the killer a monster, I think makes this story more interesting. The occult, hotel spells, Coffin Baby needing to keep the building intact for its own survival. It's all great. The red herring is Ned, of course, and, and obviously he was too obvious to begin with, but I do appreciate how damn awkward and creepy he is just by misreading social situations. He's lost a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's be quite clear, he's uh, basically a non-violent stalker. And they even play with him being the killer until the very last second. I mean, if we're being honest, uh, Ned is the real victim here. The victim of shitty management. One thing I, I want to mention is that Chaz was uh, originally, and actually still is even in this cut, a ghost. <laughs> It's why he seems so poetic and calm. The only man who isn't bothered by the decay of his surroundings. And if you think about it, this ominous warning is the perfect giveaway. These renovations, they can't be good. Opening the place up like a patient anesthetized upon a table, not good. Only the scene where Nell finds his skeletal remains in the group of bodies was cut for time. So I think the, the real weight of him sort of being undead is lost, but still a cool thing to know about. You know, I often wonder when Toolbox Murders will get its reevaluation. It's not trying to change the genre, but with a magnetic cast led by the always amazing Angela Bettis, inventive kills, fun thrills, and some great 2000s angst, I hope that in my lifetime I see this get the respect it deserves. Toby Hooper gave us one of his better movies near the end of his life. And as a guy that always came off down to earth and cool, thanks for everything you gave us. The masters of horror that I was raised on are slowly leaving this plane. And whatever existence lies on the other side of the barrier, thank you for everything you did. And until then, I shall smoke a cigar in your honor. Don't
don't believe what you refuse to see. 